met. This is where it all began. No, Raz. This is where it all ended. My name is Raz. And today is my first official day on the job. It was a woman commanding serpents of water. Maligula. She's been dead for 20 years! <laughs> Nevertheless, she still has her loyal followers to this day. Now, I'm ready for anything. That's cute. <laughs> You're not at camp anymore, Raz. You don't usually see this in the physical world. Just remember your facing brainy soldier. The Psychonauts. We're not here to change people's minds. We're not here to fix people. Don't panic. <laughs> you should panic. We're here to help people fight their own demons. I know what you're up to, kid. Yeah, Just keep out of my head. Are you really sorry? I don't think you understand the gravity of the situation you're in. Maligula really could rise again. We need to get to the bottom of this. You're right. We do. Here goes nothing. That brain was booby trapped. Someone hired him. Someone on the inside. I'm not sure who to trust anymore. Isn't it great? The Psychonauts haven't had this kind of a threat in years. <laughs> Too late to turn back now. My name is Raz. And today is my first official day on the job. Dad, what are you doing here? Son, the whole family is here. My little booty. Oh, no. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming, and welcome to our talk for Psychonauts 2, bringing classic characters into the modern era. Um, just a reminder, if we could please ask you to silence your cell phones and any other noisemakers, that would be really appreciated. Uh, a spoiler warning, just in case you haven't played the game, we're showing some characters that may reveal some minor or major plot surprises. I'm Dave Russell, also known as Rusty, a double fine if you hear Zara, Zara, call me Rusty, that's why. Um, I was the lead character artist on Psychonauts 2. I've been at Double Fine for about 20 years now, working as a character artist, an animator, and as a, a department lead. Uh, before games, I actually have a background in the theatrical set design and scenic painting. I'm Zara Amirabadi. I'm a character artist. I just started about five years ago at Double Fine, and I joined a game. I, I just joined to work on Psychonauts 2. Before that, I used to work as a graphic designer, and I have a background in fine art and visual communication. So just to give you a quick overview of our time together today, we're going to talk about the history of the first game and how the characters were created. Then we'll discuss how we stayed faithful to that look after 15 long years and how brand new tools and a brand new engine helped us improve our process on the sequel. Then we'd like to go over a few ways characters were concepted for Psychonauts 2. Zara's going to deep dive into the de development pipeline. Oops, sorry. Live. <laughs> and then we're going to do a short demo in Substance 3D Painter and show the techniques we use to create the materials. Then we're going to wrap it up with a Q&A at the end. 
So Double Fine Productions was founded in the year 2000 by Tim Schafer, who you may recognize from such classic LucasArts games as Day of the Tentacle, Full Throttle, and Grim Fandango. Double Fine's first and perhaps best known game was Psychonauts, followed five years later by Brutal Legend, and over the years, many more. So let's take a little trip back in time and talk about Psychonauts just for a brief recap. Psychonauts started production in 2000, the same year as we were actually founding the studio and building up the company, and it was targeted as a launch title for the new Xbox game console that Microsoft was set to release. In the game, you play as a boy with psychic powers named Raz, who infiltrates a psychic summer camp that's run by an organization known as the Psychonauts. Throughout the game, you enter other characters' minds who have, uh, let's just say, a variety of mental health challenges, and their minds serve at the, as the game's levels. When it comes to the production of the characters themselves, you know, it, it might be hard to imagine this day of millions of polygons and PBR lighting and materials and sculpting anything you can possibly imagine in ZBrush or VR that during the tone ages of the early 2000s, all of Psychonauts' characters were created by pushing and pulling polys and verts around in Maya, which itself was only a few years old. We had a core team of two character modelers, including yours truly. Back then, being the scrappy startup that we were, whoever modeled the character actually generally created the rig and did all the skin weights as well. And eventually, we started animating the characters and the cutscenes because the character models were already finished. We created roughly 75-ish characters for the game because of the tech requirements those early consoles had. That meant some pretty low poly counts. Luckily, the wonky art style was rather forgiving of planar surfaces and sharp changes in direction. Now, all the character textures actually weren't created by the character artists like most of us do nowadays, but rather they were painted by a super talented group of traditional 2D artists in Photoshop. And we relied mostly on a combination of color maps, normal maps, and what we called back then gloss maps. Uh, these are the textures for Raz, by the way, that you're looking at. As we look at Coach and Lily's texture sets to other characters from the original, something important to note is that almost all the detail, the highlighting, the shading, and the specular highlights were painted into the base color map, which of course is everything you shouldn't do in a PBR pipeline and engine. Also interesting to note is that Raz and most of the other characters have next to no normal map information for their faces. Uh, Lily doesn't even have a gloss map for her face, and I have no idea why anymore. It was a long time ago, guys. <laughs> Our art director for Psychonauts, Scott Campbell, always wanted to emphasize that the characters should look more like stop-motion puppets in their scale, so that their clothes look like they were made with human-scale cloth and yarn. Honestly, I am not too sure how successful we were in conveying that back then, but we did try to incorporate that idea as much as possible while we were updating them. However, some things just wouldn't read correctly in oversized scale. Oops. Oh, <laughs> For instance, the weave of yarn on a sweater, or stripes of corduroy pants, or the ribbing on your socks, they're really difficult to read at a glance when your characters have arms and legs about as big around as a chopstick. So, for instances like that, we opted to stick closer to a more in-scale size for those details. So, let's talk about Psychonauts 2 a bit and our fundamental challenge. How do we replicate as much of the look, the painterly style, and the shape language from the first game without breaking all the rules for a physically based rendering workflow? We got a chance to see what worked and what didn't by recreating some of the characters from Psychonauts 1 that we knew were going to appear in the sequel. The following are a few comparison shots of those characters. So, you know, we had all these new tools at our disposal, like ZBrush and Painter. So this update became a real balancing act between being faithful to the original model, seeing if we could incorporate anything new from those old orthos that we would look at again, because maybe we would have missed something back, back in the day. And maybe, maybe, making the models a bit more rigging friendly by using symmetry anywhere we could. Yeah, I know, symmetry, symmetry, organic life isn't symmetrical, but... Every character in Psychonauts was lovingly hand-created with no mirroring. It also was rigged with no standardized rigging tool, so all the characters were asymmetrical. 
but seriously, pro tip, if you don't want your rigging team to beat you up with a baseball bat, do not give them a model that's just barely asymmetric. So we decided very early on when sculpting these characters in ZBrush that adding more detail to the characters' faces, like bone structure or even pores or fine wrinkles, pushed them too quickly onto the path of realism. Our characters have so many weird and wonky shapes that we could have ended up with some pretty odd trips into the uncanny valley, kind of like these Simpsons characters, as imagined by the talented Hossein Diva. I mean, if you look at Lisa, Lisa Simpson and the next person on this slide, you'll see the similarities. Same face. In other words, just because we could do all this new stuff didn't mean that we should. In fact, when we, shot, when we showed Scott Campbell some of these early sculpts that we were doing, he went even further and said things like, you know, nope, take out the philtrum on the upper lip. You know, that's the line between your nose and your lip. Or, you know, get rid of the creases around the nose and the nostrils. Or, you know what, just take out the nose altogether. The point is, we realized very early on that we should keep to the simplicity of the original models. So what we did decide to do was create ZBrush sculpts that emphasize the larger details, especially the ones that contribute to the overall silhouette of the character. We kept most of the micro detail out of the sculpt because we knew that Painter could handle that better when it came time to edit and change things. And really, we didn't want the micro details in the normal map anyhow, because in the engine it just made things a little too crunchy for Psychonauts. So, like the first game, most of the characters' faces had very little normal information. We also you know, bent the rules of PBR by using the curvature and AO maps that Painter baked out for us to our advantage to mimic the highlights and shadows that were painted into the first game's textures. Hopefully, just enough to work well with the lighting, but not enough to fight against it. And even though we had roughness and metalness channels now, they were used very sparingly because honestly, the first game wasn't very shiny. And it felt right to continue that and use metalness and roughness when things really needed some bling. As we lit the game, we realized that we needed to update our base color textures because in some areas, our characters were just really hard to see. This meant lightening dark values in the texture so that we could guarantee no matter what lighting scenario our characters were in, they would be lit properly. So we created a simple PBR value checker in Unreal that would highlight all the values that were either too light in green, which hardly ever happened for us, or too dark in red, and as you can see, Sasha really failed spectacularly. That's because we wanted to be as true as possible to the colors and values of the original textures from the first game, or to the new color concepts as they came in. But you know what, Painter makes the edits like this so painless because of our simple approach, which involved using mostly fill color layers with masks, so all we had to do, do was adjust the value slider on a few layers, re-export them, and we were done. Eventually, we did start getting new character design, designs for characters, so let's talk about the overall production of characters for Psychonauts 2. This might sound like a bit of deja vu, but all of the characters were created by pushing and pulling verts and polys around in Maya. No, I'm kidding. And all the characters were sculpted in ZBrush and retopologized in either Maya or Topogun. What actually is deja vu, though, is that once again, we had a core team of two character artists. However, this time we created 120 new characters And not only that, we created multiple outfits for many of the main characters. But perhaps most importantly, we hired a tech artist to take over all the rigging and skinning of the characters. So that freed Zara and me up to concentrate solely on the models and the materials. So let's dig in on how we created those 120 new characters. You know, while honestly, while we were working on the game, we didn't think too much about the differences in the development process for all these characters. A character is a character is a character, right? But while we were developing this talk, we realized that there actually are three interesting development paths that our characters followed before we could realize those as models. So let's take a look at those. The first and main development path is what we'll call the standard character pipeline. That meant that we usually had finalized orthos that we could start from. But orthos don't just appear out of thin air. There were many, many explorations of look dev that our old friend Scott Campbell did in order to start narrowing down the possibilities of a character's design based on the story as it developed. 
And we also had meetings to talk over animation concerns or tech art issues before we picked the final design that was turned into orthos that we could refer to while modeling. Double Fine has always been very character focused, so we make every effort to stay as faithful to the concepts as possible and not compromise on the visual design. Not that we don't have some room to add our own personal touches now and then. Sometimes development varied based on a character's function in the game. So for something like an enemy, there were more aspects to consider than just the visual design to take and have those in consideration, such as how does it feel to interact with them? How much combat space do they need in this level? What kind of gameplay programming effort will they need? And how will they look in all of our totally different levels? So for an enemy, we usually started off with explorations of shapes and silhouettes and what kind of attack they would have. Like are they a close range melee enemy or do they have an area attack or are they a big beefy brawler? Based on those discussions, we made a basic model that we li like to refer to as a pizza box version at Double Fine. And we tested those out to make sure that all the departments were happy the direction this enemy was going. Then Scott came in to draw concepts based on the pizza box geometry, and the development process pretty much followed the same lines as the standard development orthos to a final model. Bosses had similar considerations as enemies, but they had a few extra twists. They each had their own dedicated level, which helped inform their visual design. They also had multiple phases during the battle that could affect how they looked. Concepts of the bosses and the boss level happened hand in hand, but differently for every boss in the game, so we had to be really flexible and adapt as we went along based on the needs that popped up during the development of the experience as a whole. We tried to use placeholder geometry and temp animations as long as possible until we thought we had a working battle. Uh, unfortunately, that still didn't mean the boss design worked. So these are actually two versions of the Lucktopus boss, or Lucky as we call her. Bad name, apparently. Uh, that made it all the way to animation before the team decided to go in a different direction. And we went back to the drawing board. This is actually the final version of Lucky. You know, it's the same idea as an oct of an octopus, but this time, made to look more like the character whose mind you're in and leaning really heavily into the neon casino vibe. She actually brings us to the third way development differed for some of the characters, and those are the ones who are more visual effects than models, or a hybrid of model and effects like Lucky in the last slide. Uh, she's actually kind of a two for the price of one because she's a blend of function within a boss fight and technical challenges. So obviously these characters involved working very closely with our VFX artists. This enemy is known as the Bad Mood and it went through many concept phases. The first was a stormy rain cloud that slowed down the player, but ultimately we ended up with a big ball of scratchy lines that's kind of reminiscent of the scribbles that appear over characters in comic strips when they're mad. The only mesh on this guy actually ended up being his face and his arms. For the panic attack, excuse me, panic attack, we went through the typical enemy pipeline, but we narrowed in on this look for a certain level in the game. And we all liked this appearance so much that it actually became his default look. So he ultimately had a really simple texture treatment and was more about the masks that we painted in Painter for his visual effects. While we're talking about the character pipeline, we mentioned a few characters like bosses and enemies, but there's one other characteristic that Psychonauts is known for, and that's all the level-specific characters. And that's because all of Psychonauts 2's levels were built uniquely since they were based on the personality and emotional state of the character's mind. For that reason, the crowds and the background characters were designed especially for each and every level. For example, because one of the characters named Cassie was an author, all of her level's NPCs were book illustrations made of paper. Even Cassie herself became paper, but for different aspects of herself. Sometimes characters saw other people differently in their own mind. For instance, Psy King saw these you know, real world models as his own senses who play in a psychedelic rock band. We also had enemies who got level-specific looks. 
but we made them using the same rig so they could share animations, and then we just turned off different outfits or you know, model groupings and swapped textures instead. So now that all the look dev and prep work has resulted in an ortho that allows us to begin crafting our characters, I'm gonna hand it over to Zara so that she can discuss what comes next. Zara? Now you have a good idea of how character cre creation process goes, thanks to Rusty. I kind of like to talk a little bit about how our job, how, they, how is our day-to-day -day job as a 3D character artist. And for that purpose, I pick one of my favorite characters, Gisu. She's actually the first character I sculpted when I joined the team. So when we have the final concept and we have all the orthos approved, the, the first step is just blocking the mesh inside ZBrush. This is a really quick process. It takes about like a couple of hours maximum a day. And the main purpose is to see how that beautiful 2D design translates into 3D. And quite often, someone from animation team is gonna ask us to, simple, to put some simple rig in so they can use it for a cutscene layout. And they won't be blocked by us why we are actually working to make the final model. Right after that, I'm going to do the ZBrush scope. The ZBrush scope is usually scheduled just for a week. But it may vary based on the complexity and the number of revisions we need to do for that. We can detail it as much as we want. But specifically for Psychonaut 2, and as a Rusty mentioned earlier, we leave all the macro details out. So we don't put any fabric details, we don't put any skin, uh, any skin pores or anything like that. When the final ZBrush is, like when I'm done with the ZBrush model, I would give it to our concept artist. So he would give me feedback with drawing over and then ask me to do some edits. Hopefully, hopefully, every drastic change that we need to do happen at this stage. It, that doesn't mean it's um, impossible to change it later on, but it would, but it would going to like, uh, add a lot of reworking down the pipeline. For example, if we need, add, and we need to add a joint, it would mess up all the animation and a lot of reworking for that. So we try to do it at this stage. I would address the feedback, make the ZBrush scope approved, and move on to the next stage. Now we have a beautiful ZBrush skull with gazillions of polygons, and I need to use that as a reference to create a suitable model to use in the game. Uh, I need to knock it down by a couple of thousand. I, I use that as a reference to do a low poly, make pre, uh, really proper UVs that I can use in my material pass, and just pass it down to our uh, tech artist. Adam, our tech artist, he mentioned we had one for the whole project. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> he would do all the skinning and rigging and just pass it down to our animation team to do uh, some testing. And our animation animators, won't, they try their best to break it any way they can, make him cry. But uh, at the, while they're working on that process, we simultaneously would have started doing our material pass right away when we have the UVs. So what is the material pass? I kind of like to think about, like, as a fashion phase of our process, we kind of do a little dress up here. I, I like to play dress up. And we take this low poly model we created, use painter, using the high poly, mo uh, high poly machine ZBrush as a reference, again, inside painter to create all those uh, textures, and then make it look really highly detailed as it actually is. Um, this, creating this illusion is really fun, actually. We have a lot of creative freedom, um, like adding a little bit of salt and pepper, and then we can have our personal touches here. So how do we start that? Early on, when our concept art is approved, one of our concept art is going to do a color exploration, <laughs> like dozens of them, as you see. And then we're gonna sit together and pick our favorite, and collectively, as a team, eventually we're gonna narrow that to one. When we have that one that we picked, our concept art is going to provide us with some material callout. This real, real world material callout are actually really useful for us because this is the main reference we use to create all the textures and material inside Painter. Uh, for example, look at that uh, Bieber shirt, the, the plaid shirt on the bottom corner. That was the one we used as a reference to create something similar for Gisu here. 
it's worth mentioning that it is efficient to try to look at uh, the existing material, a substance 3D community asset, or in the uh, library of materials already existing in some times, because you don't always have to start from scratch. For example, in this case, luckily there was already a, a plaid material like there. All we needed to do just to uh, change the colors. And we use the most, uh, we actually use this filter called, uh, what is it, warp? Warp. Warp. Yeah. We call it like wankify it to make all the straight lines not, don't look straight. You know, there is kind of no straight line in Psychonauts. So this is the uh, field layer method we're talking about. Uh, we just use a field layer to use the base color and then using the same method to add, uh, to create some uh, shadow using the AO on a mask layer and using the curvature to add some highlight on that. So now you can see, um, now you can see the detail of the highlight and the shadow. And we also have some brush stroke that we already painted. I use them as a procedural adding to this to kind of uh, break up the value, of, value and the hue of the base color. So you have, give it kind of like a painterly look. And you see that pais uh, golden paisley pattern in the back of her scarf. We also like that, we would like to do that usually through the same process. We paint the whole thing inside Photoshop and bring it in as a procedural. And then we have a lot of freedom to move it around. And at the end, put work on it. This, uh, this is Gisu's purse. This is a really good example to show that we don't do a lot of uh, detail in ZBrush. Everything you see being created in Painter. And that means if someone comes in and they don't like the color, they don't like the graphics, they anything, uh, it's really easy to just change that with Painter. And in a little bit, actually, I'm going to show you how to do that inside Painter, right after looking her final look inside the game. I think she kind of turned out cute, right? Is she your favorite? She's my favorite, uh... kind of, <laughs> but also, for the demo, I picked my other favorite. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so for the purpose of demo, I picked Lizzie. She's my other favorite character. So she's one of the more complex character I created for the game, not only because she has so many accessories and details, but also if you look at her concept art in the middle, it's a really nice 2D design somehow I have to translate all those squiggles to 3D and figure out what are the materials. And I have to do, uh, I have to go a lot of back and forth. Uh, it was, I think in this case, it was between man, me and Scott. So he had to paint over and like give me some more references. And finally, like that's what I got to start from. Yeah, Scott likes to give us orthos that are actually a bunch of scribbles and then we have to figure out what to actually make from that. Now I'm going to load up her file and show you how we do some of these. And drink some water. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you are actually new to Substance Painter, but if you're uh, familiar at all with Photoshop, it works in much the same way. And as soon as you can wrap your head around that, it becomes a lot more intuitive to use. So it really is based a lot on the layer stack and blend modes and masks. So um, you ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. So, we start with the fill layer, just as I said. So the main one, which is the base we use, let's call it base. We don't want to have any uh, perimeter. Uh, it's actually it's the only layer we want to have all the perimeters on. Uh, bear, like in some cases we have it on in other ones, but this is the main one, and I'll tell you uh, later why. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we don't want anything shiny except some cases, so I bring roughness all the way up. Uh, let's throw in some like color. Oh, I want to, uh, let's do some something blue. And then I'm going to add another fill layer. So this is the layer I'm going to add curvature. So for this one, I close down everything. And this is the process happens over and over and over for 
everything we do here. And then I would add a bitmap mask and just add a hair ambient occlusion that we created to that one. I would add a level and a blur filter. So this would be our AO. I'm gonna make it a little bit darker. And for the purpose of demo, I'm gonna choose some colors that you can see on the projector and then show you uh, a little bit toned down version. So I'm gonna copy this. Um, this is gonna be our highlight. What's that you're doing there, Zara? Are you actually naming every layer you're making? That's crazy talk. <laughs> so this is one of our OCDs. So yeah. <laughs> I drilled this into her brain as soon as she arrived. Like, so Psychonauts was 15 years ago, right? Sometimes we look back at our old files and we have no idea what we were thinking back then. So um, if it's for the sake of yourself and your coworkers and maybe future coworkers who you don't even know yet, try to name your stuff especially with a descriptor that really specifies why it's there. Exactly. So for the highlight, I just replace it with the curvature. So I'm going to show you what we do. If you look at this, this is our AO map. Uh, we are, we're using level to, first, I'm going to invert it. You don't see much. So. Based on the character and how much detail you have, you have to crank it up. And you don't always get a perfect look because you always have an option to add a paint and paint the area you don't like to. I'm not gonna do that right now in the interest of time. Uh, but yeah, you have to like crank it this a lot and also put it in multiply. Uh, although this is AO and it's supposed to be dark, we never use black like barely use black in Psychonauts. Well, that's partly because 2D artists painted all those textures and most traditional artists kind of shy away from black. Yeah. And then would blur it, but the blur is usually like barely you can see it there. Sometimes I think why even I put it there, but, but you, you will see. Because I told you to. <laughs> So for the highlight, you see this is the curvature, but what we get from it actually is not going to look anything like that. We crank it down all the way. Oh, I should put Yeah, this change up. a color on that one. Like maybe red so they can see. This is going to turn out pretty, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also, definitely, we always need to use paint and cover some area because, like, for example, eyelashes never have highlight, so we, we, we need to, like, you know, come in and, like, fix the areas, like, little by little. So this is the main thing we do, like, uh, which is, like, really uh, just for psychonauts, just feel layer, mask, feel layer, mask. Like, if we do, like, procedural, we do the exact same thing. We, don't, we are not using any layer to paint. And that's because like, it's really easy to change all the colors, and we do that all the time. So for the purpose of demo, I created some smart material that actually has all of these. And I'm going to bring in some and show you. Let's see. Have some of the flat colors. So as you see, the base color has everything. In this case, I don't have any roughness. <laughs> because uh, usually for the skin, we actually throw in some uh, dots that's roughness and barely visible to just have some breaks. We also add some textures in there, like as a procedural. Uh, this is one of the textures you can see here that um, Bagel painted for us. I just Bagel throw. is one of the concept artists, by the way, who painted probably half the textures in Psychonauts 1. So he was back for Psychonauts 2 as well. So if I show you the texture, oh, let me actually make it bigger. You see, we don't want small area. We want them to be really uh, large, because if they're small, they would just add noise. And then we don't want to see noise. And often, we would like duplicate that. And 
there is something there. This is as much as we put in a game, but I'm gonna crank it for you. Yeah, crank that up. Maybe I can change the color so they can see actually the opacity would work too. Can you guys see any of that on the screen? Okay. Yeah. There is, there is something there, but it's not super big. This is how we get the painterly look. And then we go in and add more like paint layers and then probably pick up a brush. I like to use the wash brush. Um, make it bigger and just go to the color. It would paint some blush. Like you see, uh, you might not see it really well, but there are some bricks on a concept, so we want to have all of those in here. Plus, we almost always wanted things to have at least a base color, a secondary color, and maybe a tertiary color, or maybe five tertiary colors, just depending on. <laughs> I think I've and, ended up so many. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's some characters that have lots and lots of layers. And we play around a lot with the blend modes on those, too, because sometimes you know, you can put it on multiplier value or something like that. But I usually just pick from the top and just click all the way down to see if I get even more interesting effects than I even thought of in my head. And a lot of times I use those instead. I'm gonna use an example of how I add freckles. There are already a lot of brushes in here that you can play with the spacing. And just like that. And you see, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Sara, come on. Well, the thing is that. Uh, People could be watching this at home. <laughs> but as you see, the same fill layer has, uh, with the mask has so many paint layers. And still, I'm going to play with the blending mode not make it disappear. And also, multiply. Usually, usually multiply, overlay, do a good job. But keep duplicating them and add more and more and more. And I think you get the idea. The nice thing about doing this is once you've done one character whose skin you like, you can actually create a smart material from that and just plop it on the next character. And usually you may need to you know, change the colors and stuff like that or paint a different type of mask for them. But it's really easy to get that skin finished pretty quickly, actually. Yeah, like I remember like Lizzie was one of the characters actually. I used uh, her as a reference for a lot of, like for example, we have some blue skin characters and then we would use the blue one that we like as a start of. I, of course, all the painter, painted area need to be happening again. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, like we don't use a lot of height and roughness and stuff like that, but like this is her final skin texture. And let's see. As you see, like her lips are just height. There is no sculpt there. And this is because uh, Scott didn't like to have big lips or anything for the character, so this is, th and this was the solution we came in. Yeah, I swear to God, if Scott could just have characters with uh, eyeballs, <laughs> no mouth, no face, he would be so happy. Also, eyeballs that are twice as big as your skull, so you have to figure out how to make that work. This uh, tattoos are mostly brought in procedural, and then I use the same method to paint over and over and over on the layer, and I can easily just change the color whenever I need. So I'm gonna move on to show you more interesting stuff. I wanna show you how I created her um, uh, torso. There was a lace and some roses, and let's see, it's loading. <laughs> okay. Again, I made the base fill layer, so we are not losing time for that. So I, again, as you see, there is a fill layer, there is a mass, and there is a fill. And then what I would do is, I think for her, I use like this fence 
to create lace for her. And as you see, it's really tiny. And this is one of the things in Psychonauts, we didn't want anything too small because it would make everything noisy. So I would go in, scale it up, maybe crank it a little bit more. I think I wanted to scale it up more, maybe a little less. Well, now it's gone. Yeah, okay. And then I would add some warp. And then the next one would be, uh, I want to throw some art there. So I painted some roses in Photoshop, and I think they're here. And then I throw them again in the fill layer. So I would use a level to invert it. And uh, this is another one that have a little bit of a uh, va different value. Like it has a, a little bit of roughness and actually have some height. So it looks like they're kind of uh, like ro actual lace material. And then I would add, uh, so there are some times when you bring in uh, procedural materials, I'm gonna show you on the textures that when you have the UVs, they don't always line up and that's where I'm going to add a paint and just fix it easily, and that's done. She has it there. And let's see. And this is actually how I proceed to do the whole torso material. Yeah, this really is a pretty simple method, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, when the painter, uh, Substance 3D painter, asked us to do this talk, we told them, this is going to be super simple. <laughs> but I, I'd like you to know uh, that even if it's simple, you have a lot of freedom to create really complicated look. Like, Lizzie's look is really complicated. Even for hair feather, she has a lot of iridescence that I actually painted those, and then we feed those into the iridescent shader we had. So I'm just gonna turn on her other material so you just can see how she ended up. At the end, if you have any question about any part, just ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll I would be here to answer you. Yeah, I think Lizzie actually is the most visually complex character that Scott designed for either game, so uh, she was kind of a balancing act between how well does she read, because she's one of those characters who's got chopsticks for arms and legs. Like, how do you even know what a tattoo is on her? Because you can't see very much of her arm to make sense of it. And that lace is just crazy and still rendering, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I did have fun to do the tattoos. I watched all the uh, ink master to design her tattoos. <laughs> That's some real, real dedication. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, since this loading, I'm just going to show you the final uh, render. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is her completed material pass inside the engine. She had some fur shader that I needed to create a little uh, more textures inside Painter that they could feed it to make that fur shader. And the iridescent feather. But uh, I think she had like four revisions, right? And I think yeah. the last revision was a week we shipped the game. And I'm gonna actually hand it over to Rusty. He can talk about our polish pass and then how we proceed doing those. So, you know, sometimes because of production deadlines, we had to say this is just good enough. And we needed to leave details out of the initial pass and add them to our backlog in order to get the work done on time. We hoped that if there was time left at the end to revisit, we'd do a polish pass. And spoilers, there was. So we actually reworked several characters' hair sculpts because we had previously sculpted the hair with very little detail in it. So original on the left, rework on the right. And we realized that some of the characters who came online later looked better with more sculptural detail that worked with the hair shader that we actually had created in the engine. 
Also, time passed during the course of production. A lot of it, five years of making this game meant that we needed to upgrade to new software multiple times. And frankly, sometimes a character that we created years before just didn't look as good as one that we did more recently because we got better as time went on. The end of development also allowed us to look at all the rigs together as a whole and decide if, as a team if there were any characters who didn't quite mesh with all the others. For instance, we decided that we really needed to do a pass on all the background characters to make sure they had consistent hair and skin colors. So to do that, Zara went into Painter and corrected one skin color and one hair color for each head. She created smart materials from those, and then all she had to do was adjust the fill layers to the correct color values, and thanks to Painter, just like that, we had 35 color variations for each head to pick from. So, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to summarize five years of work into a few minutes on stage. I mean, we, we created so many characters that it's honestly hard to remember them all. I mean, I'm lucky to remember to put on pants when I leave the house at this point, but <laughs> even with a global pandemic and all the challenges that every one of us in this audience faced, Zara and I are, are both proud of what we were able to achieve and continue the legacy of this beloved game. So that concludes our talk. We hope you enjoyed seeing a look at the character art pipeline at Double Fine. And we hope you understand that stylized character materials are possible and actually not very difficult with Painter. Some relatively elaborate textures are achievable with a relatively small tool set that's pretty simple to learn. Uh, if you would like to know more about Double Fine or working with us on our exciting new projects, please visit our company websites. Thank you for coming to our talk. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them now. me? Yes. Cool. Um, so you mentioned the two of you built over 100 characters. Yes. Um, I'm curious how you managed to balance your time between lead responsibilities like planning and tasking and sculpting with hands-on keyboard stuff. It seems difficult. It, it is difficult. <laughs> we actually had a little more help. That's why I said it was a core team. Uh, towards the end, we had another uh, double fine character artist who helped us out a little bit. And we actually outsourced most of the rando background characters. And they did also did our animals. But that also meant that I was art, art, you know, trying to give them feedback and Zara feedback and our other character artist feedback all the time. So um, the good thing is I got pretty quick at Substance Painter. It's kind of my happy place in the whole process. And I kind of go into the Zen mode and don't realize that eight hours have passed and I should just go home now. Or since I'm in the, uh, during the pandemic in my own house, go upstairs now. <laughs> so. Um, we also had a great art director who took a lot of the responsibilities of um, um, getting feedback to the right people. So does that help? Yeah, thank did you. I, did I actually repeat the question so you all could hear it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the question oh, was. By the way, before every, everyone leaves, it would be great if you, could, uh, if you all can uh, fill the survey. If yeah, you if you have talk. surveys, that'd be great. OK, uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you uh, already answered this question, but how many plugins did you have to use, um, if any, uh, to like finish, you know, the character design? Sorry, how many what? Plugins for what for, software? Uh, for Substance, like, did you have to build any plugins to like? So the question is, did we use any plugins in Substance to do what we did? The answer is no. We didn't use any plugins. No. Oh, okay. Hey. Uh, first off, great job on the game. Thank great you. The game, love it. Looks great. Uh, I was wondering. I know you're both character artists, but is there is this the similar pipeline to what the environment art and the prop design had to go through? Uh, so the question is: Is character art pipeline similar to environment art? And it's really pretty different, at least at Double Fine, because we're lucky enough to get uh, orthos of characters from many different views. That gives us a lot to work from when we're actually doing the sculpt. Environment artists might get a look dev piece or a, you know, a, a concept art that's sort of a overview of what a level should look like. And then it's up to them to make the actual level pretty much from their own imaginations. We actually call them 
world, uh, world builder yeah. because they work with the concept artist and the game designer all together as a team to figure out how to do it. So it's really different. Okay. I, I feel like we're spoiled, actually. But, uh, but if it goes for substance, we had like a dedicated um, material artist, and uh, Kristen, she would make all the materials, and uh, she would actually use substance designer to create some procedurals that the environment, the, our environment artist could use, but as character team, we would do our own materials. Okay, so if you had something like a, like a fur or like a burlap thing, they could reuse the same smart material? Yeah, theoretically, yeah. Most of the stuff that they do for the world building is tileable materials, obviously, so, um, but if we saw something, because we had a Psychonauts 2 shelf in Substance that was just all of our own smart materials, if Zara and I needed, say, wood or burlap, for example, we would steal from that because why would we recreate something that already exists? You know, there's probably like five different kinds of wood uh, material for Psychonauts that's all wonky wood grain and stuff like that. So if I ever needed wood, I'd just grab it from there and modify it as I needed it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, so I noticed when you're doing the demonstration, you had a couple uh, different uh, texture sets in your texture set list. Was that for the presentation today or is there sort of a workflow uh, advantage to that in the sense of maybe you can workshop a couple different textures in the same file? Uh, do you mean when I have like a torso or a skin or something? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that it was on the bottom right It's usually corner. like, uh, we usually have about a minimum four. Uh, one goes for a skin. We try to have the skin separately because usually when it goes in a, uh, because when it goes inside the engine, they have their own like uh, surfaces. They need subsurfaces scattering at different values. And we want to have the more, more detailed area and focus on the face, so we wanted to have big. So the skin gets its own. Uh, hair gets its own because they use a different shader. And then body part uses its own. What, what else do we have? Um, it just depends on how big the character is, too. If you need to, like, if there's a lot of surface that you need to cover, a lot of times we'll break it up into three or four text, or, sorry, for the body, at least, we would break it up into two or three texture sets, probably. Just because, you know, you want to have the same textile density for all those textures, hopefully. So. I think we usually do one for the body, but for her, I did two because she had so many details and they would turn up like being really small and not good. So I, bro I broke it up to two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was wondering, um, you've talked about how you pull from your environment artist's libraries of tileable textures when you need them. Was there ever an instance where the opposite was true, where a uh, new texture need came up for a specific type of material that did not yet exist? I think so. And uh, you had to do that yourself, and how did you handle that? So the question was, uh, since we cribbed from the environment artist, was there ever a time that we needed to create our own? Um, it didn't happen very often, actually, but there was, there was one or case. two, right, for a stocking cap that looked like it had multicolored yarn in it, but we asked Kristen to do it for us. Uh, it was also when I created uh, the Cassie Witch, the one it's covered in honey. And I think I created it first, and Kristen kind of liked it, so she asked me to give my assets so she could create that for the environment. So did you create a smart material in uh, yourself? No, or? I gave all the assets I painted. Uh, actually, I gave her my smart material, so she looked into it and made hers in her own way. Probably in designer, since Probably it was a Probably in designer, yeah. because we don't use designer, so she, she looked into it to how I recreate that in designer. But she used my alphas and maps and stuff I created. OK, awesome. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the amazing talk you gave. Um, one question I had about your texturing pipeline is when you were selecting the base colors and other colors in the textures, were there any considerations that you made to make sure that the characters looked as they were designed in engine with the proper lighting? Could you repeat that one more time? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to make sure I understand. I, I think he means the color we picked did it matter because of the engine, right? Yes. Okay, so the question is, when we do those fill layers, um, do the colors we pick matter once we get them into the engine and see if they work or not? Yes, and did you have to adjust them anyway to make sure that they looked as they were intentionally designed? 
once in a while we would do that, but again, every level was so different. It was really hard to say that's the color it should be because it's in 14 different levels with totally different lighting and some had totally different render styles even. So um, can you think of? Um, not necessarily like that. We did have to change some of them. Like for example, a certain character was not really visible in a certain level, so we had to change it, but it would affect every single level that uh, we, we pick a better range that would be visible in every other level, but it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, the main thing was that we just had to fix those PBR values because they were just too dark, and that was my, you know, our bad on that one. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you so much. Hi there. Hello. I was curious about um, your relationship with Scott in the pipeline. I mean, he's turning out these orthos so quickly. Does he work willy-nilly? And you guys just pick which character to work on next, or is he throwing them at you one at a time? So the question is, what is it like to work with Scott Campbell? Mm. <laughs> well, I've only been doing it for about 21 years now. So actually, he is one of the best collaborators you could hope to have. Um, he can come up with 100 drawings for a character in a day. So um, it really depended on the production. Uh, what do I want to say? The production schedule. Like we, we kind of knew usually what characters needed to come when. A lot of that was based on what levels were going to get worked on. A lot of it was based on what cutscenes they had to work on because um, I don't know if you're all familiar with Tim Schafer games, but there's a chance that there might be a few cutscenes in, <laughs> in his games. We actually had, after you add up uh, the fully animated cutscenes, the scripted cutscenes, and dialogue trees, with over six hours of animation on this game. So um, animators were key in getting them unblocked just so they could do their job too. But um, yeah, I mean, he. Uh, the, the wealth of ideas he can come up with so quickly and the crazy ideas he comes up with just amaze me every day. And I love him to death and I love working with him. I'm really glad because he doesn't actually work for us anymore. So he came back as a contractor because I can't even imagine what a Psychonauts game would look like character-wise if Scott Campbell didn't do that. Right. So, so you guys are the ones who decide which character of his to work on next. You're the ones who call that shot in terms of the pipeline. Yeah, he, he, was, he was strictly the character concept artist on this game, so he didn't have any say in what actually happened when. <laughs> Though the board, uh, like, life happens, there were times he wasn't available, and yeah. there were cases that one of our in-house, like, they're extremely talented concept artists, like some of the bosses been designed from other artists, but they did their best to make them look like his style. Right. Yeah. I appreciate it, thank you so much. He told me to tell you guys hi, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Tell him I said good things, only, only good things. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful speech. And my question is a little bit, um, a little bit too loud. Uh, That's good. Yeah, um, a little bit out of topic is, um, I saw your pipelines, I saw doing the pipelines like uh, you guys ended, ended up like posing your character in a post, but the hand was like posing like this. Like I was thinking, I was thinking about like, um, would you prefer to have your hands like posing like this instead of this? Because th that way the, you know, the muscles of your forearm is, stri is straight instead of twisting. Uh, the question is, um, how much do we take poses into consideration when we decide, you know, how to model them? Like, should we model them like with when you're handing hands over to up? Your riggers, will you yeah. 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 prefer to in this way or no? Yeah. Since I rigged ha half the characters in the first game, I'll tell you why we do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, we, we decided that the best way to do, because you know, a lot of times you'll see T-pose, you'll uh -huh. see down straight, you'll say, see A-pose. We decided to go halfway in between those. So what's the midpoint of the possible uh, range of motion in each joint? So usually, usually your arms are sort of at a 45 degree angle, your elbows are bent at about a 45 degree angle, yeah. and your hands, we made them more relaxed posed like this, just because of an animator didn't have time, they weren't like this, you know? Oh like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, so, but honestly for Psychonauts, there's hardly any muscle tone sculpted into these guys, so it really didn't matter oh, yeah, which way it went. All right, thank you. Huh? Rusty, hey. Hey, I can't see who you are. Oh, Garof, hi, hey, buddy. Hi. Um, Ori original Psychonauts worker here. Yeah, uh, so I actually have a related question. 
working with Kim and Nathan in Photoshop way back when on the original game, what was it like to transition to Substance where you have to label your layers and do all that other kind of organizational stuff that maybe is not the most natural thing to uh, 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 natural media oil painter type? Yeah, so the question is, what was it like to work with our traditional 2D artists versus what's it like to work in Painter? Uh, office, uh, I'm, for me, at the beginning, it was terrifying because they think up some crazy color combinations that I just would never have thought of. But actually redoing some of the original characters helped me get into their mindset. Uh, I'm a pretty OCD person, so naming layers and stuff like that just comes naturally to me. I so, remember. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the more I look at their textures that they painted in Photoshop without actually seeing it on the model at the time, I just, I'm blown away by how they actually finished that job because I don't know how they did it. It's really easy. When we open each other's file, it's just like we don't feel that the other person did it. It's always like everything named and it's really actually easy to do it if you work with Photoshop. It's Pretty similar. But I actually said the thing about the blend modes just because Kim, Kim Kogan and Nathan Stapley were our, um, our two main um, texture artists for Psychonauts. Um, and as I said, they came up with some pretty crazy color combinations. That's why I would run through the blend modes just to see if I saw anything that sort of struck me as more like a Kim or Bagel's uh, color than something that I would have thought of. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful Good to see you. Presentation. Thanks. Good to see you. Hello. Hi. Thank you both for the talk. This Thank was you. awesome. Um, my question was, how long did you take on the hand painting process for the characters? Because you did a lot of procedural um, build up and making that solid base, but about how long did you take, would you say on average, to do the hand painting part and the tweaking? So the question is, how much um, time did we take in Substance Painter to do the texturing with like the fill layers and stuff like that versus actually hand painting things. Um, about a week. But how long did you actually spend hand painting stuff? Uh, well, I don't know. Actually, I never timed it. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, some of the characters don't need that much. Like, for example, uh, Sam, she was scheduled to be one week, but I finished her like maybe in three days. But someone like actually Lizzie took a little bit more than a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fill layer thing takes a couple of minutes. Yeah. Mostly it's hand painting, as you see. Okay. Um, and we're actually a little different. I try to stay away from hand painting just as much <laughs> as possible in case there actually are changes to the model that affect the UVs that affect what you've painted in substance once you bring that um, new model in. That's why I try to. I tried to sh shy away from hand painting as much as possible, so I didn't have to rework all that hand painting. But I did it. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Thank but, you both. Yeah, as a ratio, I'd say for me, it was probably 80% procedural, maybe 20% hand painted. I, I would say 50 50 for me. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Was the last question? Anyone else? Yay. Thank you. Yeah, if there's nothing else, thanks for coming, everybody.